Father, we thank you for what you have done. I try to be thankful every day. Thank you for that song. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here. Now it's come my time to preach the Word of God. I need your help. I really do. I've studied, I've prepared, I've prayed, I've meditated, I've cross-referenced all the scriptures. I've done all that that I need to do, but it means nothing without God. You give me the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God, to deliver it. And God, I pray for wisdom, and that's what I need this morning. I, I want to preach, but God, I need your help. But God, also, these folks who are listening to me need your help. Holy Spirit, I want you to go through every pew. I want you to stop at every heart. And I want you to look into their hearts. That's, you, you're not interested in the outside of us. You're look, interested on the inside of us. God, look into our hearts. And whatever you find in there that's pleasing, hallelujah. Whatever you find in our hearts that's not pleasing, convict us of it. God, if you go by and find one that's not saved, God, tell them you love them. Holy Spirit, tell them that God loves them and that they need today to make the, as Bob said, the greatest choice they will ever make is to ask you to come into their hearts. We pray for that this morning. Now, God, we, give, we, give, we just turn the service over to your control. Bind the powers of forces of evil that would try to hinder it and let us have a wonderful time here this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good to have you in God's house this morning. We're glad you're here. And if you're visiting with us, we're delighted to have visitors. And we hope you come back and be with us again. Worship with us one more time. We're in the, the book of uh, John chapter 8. And our Sunday scriptural reading is John chapter 8. And uh, so uh, we're going to uh, uh, back up there, I think it is, or we go forward wherever. I think it's, I think it's forward. And, and Mark's going to take care of this, but I want you to stand, if you would, please, and oh, the Bible's open. I do this sometimes, and I don't, like, I don't like to get in a rut. I hate ruts. I like to have diversity, and I like to do things a little differently. And sometimes I have you stand, sometimes I don't, but uh, we're going to do that this morning. And so we're going to look at John chapter 8, 1 through 11, and then we'll share with you what we're going to talk about. And verse number one says, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Okay. Number two, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman, taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, or in the middle of them, they said unto him, Master, this woman was caught, was taken, I'm sorry, in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that we should should be stoned, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him. They might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast, let him, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the old elders, even unto the last or the youngest. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Thank you. you may be seated. Very familiar, familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, we're going to talk about, let me get it back here at the first of it. I hit too many buttons. Uh, well, Mark, I'll be there in a minute. I want to talk to you about our moral monitoring system. 
Now, God gave us a conscience. Do you believe that you have a conscience? So that's your moral monitoring system. We all have one. The meanest sinner in the world has a conscience. So we, we know when we break God's law, the guilt we feel when we do something wrong, right? There's guilt. And that tells us what? We need to what? Repent. Repent. Well, when you look at verses 1 through 4, we're going to look at the purpose of the law. You know, but, but before I get there, the conscience is not mentioned in the Old Testament, just, form, just a form of introduction. It's not mentioned in the Bible, the old Bible. It's not there. You won't find the word conscience in the Old Testament. Uh, however, the word conscience is mentioned 31 times in the New Testament. 31 times, you know, it's mentioned in the New Testament. Now, our conscience operates whether you like it or not. I mean, it operates whether you like it or not. Well, I don't like to feel guilty. Well, it's going to operate anyway. You can't stop it, and I can't stop it. It operates uh, whether we like it or not. And you, can, and, and you cannot manipulate or determine yourself how, you will, how it will judge your thoughts, your intentions, or your actions. There ain't a thing you can do about it. it, it just, it's just there, and God put it in there. However, an animal doesn't have a conscience, correct? No, animal doesn't have a conscience, but we do. We all mortals have a conscience. Now, it operates independently to your normal thought process. Yeah, I've got that normal thought process. And many religious denominations, now I want you to listen to this. Many religious denominations teach that followers of various degrees that accepts their moral standards, regardless of what that are, as long as they're moral standards, this uh, de denominations, if you follow their uh, moral standards and follow the symbolic rituals, the symbolic rituals that they have. Now, here's what they say. That's the same thing as having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you buy that? Absolutely not. No. A relationship is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can follow all the dec decrees, and you can follow all the symbolics you want to, and that is not same as having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You must be born again. See, a lot of denominations don't teach that, right? They don't teach you how to be born again. You do have to be born again, right? That's not a Baptist doctrine. That's a biblical doctrine. And then we develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and God. Wonderful. Now, let's look at the purpose of the law. Verse 1 through 4, I think that's what it teaches us. Uh, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives and... Uh, Early in the morning, Jesus rose early in the morning. He came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him, sat down, and he taught them. So he left the, uh, 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 the, 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 when you look at verses number one, the Mount of Olives, and on the other side outside of Jerusalem. And so when he had left there, then he comes early in the morning, he comes to the temple, and all the people came to him. He sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and Pharisees, here's his problem. Right here is the problem that he had with the scribes who were writers of the Bible and somewhat interpretation, interpretations of the Bible, interpreters of the Bible. And the Pharisees were those religious people that wanted to make sure you kept the letter of the law. I mean, they, they were the police of, of the Judaism. And so they were there. They, they brought this woman unto him, taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Hmm. Interesting. All right, let's look at the purpose of the law before we even get into that. But I'll pick this up later. But the purpose of the law, 2,500 years between Genesis and Exodus. I didn't realize that much years when I did the research on it. From the book of Genesis to Exodus. I mean, you know, you'd think they would just kind of boom, 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 right now. 2,500. 
2,500 years from Adam to Moses, and then we come into Exodus to Moses. 2,500 years had passed. Now, we have 4,000 years from Genesis to Malachi. 2,500 years from Genesis to Exodus, and 4,000 years from Genesis to Malachi. So that's a long period of time, and between that time we got all the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets, 4,000 years. And so when we look at this scripture, the church age began in the New Testament. Actually, Jesus came to introduce the church age, right? And it got him in trouble with this crowd here. Because, you see, they, they, they caught this woman in the very act. Well, they probably knew she was committing adultery way before that. They just said, you know, Jesus over the temple, he's teaching. Let's go and let's put this before him because we want to trap him in something, you know. Let me tell you something, you can't trap God. No, God can trap you. And God can trap me, but you can't trap God. But here's some, the, the motive of these scribes, scribes and Pharisees. We've got to trap Jesus, so let's go get us a woman caught in the very act of adultery, and let's take her over there and see what he says. Oh, boy, are they in for a surprise. They are in for a surprise in this passage of Scripture. The problem with the law. There was a problem, okay? And so when you look at it, so we now at... Actually, uh, the church age was going to begin after Jesus was crucified, after Jesus ascended. Uh, and in Acts chapter 2, that's when the church age began. And we're living in it right now. See, from that period of time, so 2,000 years, 4,000 years from Genesis to Malachi, 2,000 years from, uh, from Matthew today, we're living in the church age. So we're in that, that 2,000 years. We're, we're in it now. And so I want you to understand that. So the church age. Now, the Mosaic law was given specifically to the nation of who? Israel. Just to Israel. The Mosaic law was given to the nation of Israel. Uh, there are three parts to the law, and I want to give you those three parts to it. First of all, there is the Ten Commandments, as you very well know. There are the ordinances, that's number two, and number three is the order of worship. Those are the three parts of the Mosaic law. Now, Romans 7, 7, interesting verse. The problem with the law is that they wanted Jesus to live by the Mosaic law. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. Jesus come to fulfill the law. And that got him in trouble with the scribes and the Pharisees. They're trying every way possible to trick Jesus and trap Jesus in, in that. And Jesus, you know, the law was only given in Romans 7, 7. Said, I, Paul said, I would have not known sin, except the Bible said, the law said, thou shall not. Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not lust. Thou shall not do this. So the law was beneficial, right? For 4,000 years from Genesis to Malachi, it was sufficient. It was sufficient to get people to say, wait a minute, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I can't keep the law. The law can't save you, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. The animals that were sacrificed only was for a covering of the sins of the people. There's no redemption at all in the Mosaic law. Amen. And Jesus is trying to get this point over. You're trying to get the point over to them. So there is the purpose of the law. Now, we move from the purpose of the law. Oh, mercy. Get me back there, Mark. Get me back there to the punishment of the law. Now, when you... Uh, how did I get there? Well, the devil is trying to mess it up. Smoke. We'll make it. Don't worry about it. Hang in here. I'll get back. The, the punishment of the law. We'll just look. He'll get me back there in a minute. But when you look at the verses 5 through 8, you got your Bibles. Verse 5 through 8. When we look at verse number 5, now Moses... In the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but... What sayest thou, or what do you say? 
Now they've got the woman caught in a very act of adultery, and there she is, standing before those five scribes, Pharisees, and Jesus, and the people he's teaching, right? She's there. Now, and, and this is what they said to Jesus in verse number 5. Now Moses commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? Now that's a question they asked Jesus. What do you say, Jesus? Well, he had a lot to say. He had something not only to say, but he had something to do. Now, verse number 6. And this they said, tempting him. They were tempting. That the whole purpose of being there was to tempt him. And uh, so, uh, verse number five, or six, I'm sorry, uh, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now, so they said, what do you say, Jesus? Well, he just kindly stooped down in the dirt, and there he began to write on. He didn't say nothing, right? He said nothing. Not one thing did he say. And so they were there to accuse him as though he heard them not. Now, verse number seven. So when they continued asking him, what do you say, Jesus? What do you say, Jesus? What do you say, Jesus? Just continuously asking him, what do you say? We got this woman. She's guilty. What are we going to do with her, Jesus? What are we going to do with her? They ask him. He lifted up himself. He lifted up himself and said unto them, All right, you ask me, I'm going to tell you. You ask me what I was going to do with her, but I want to ask you a question. Well, that's a statement, really, not a question. I'm sorry. He, you, that be without sin. I'll tell you what I want you to do. You grab up the first rock. You grab the first rock and you throw at her. That's what he said, right? You throw it at her. Oh, now. You cast the stone at her. Punishment of the law. Moses, it did say. Moses did say, you know. But see... It was all an act, uh, uh, trying to trick him and trying to trap him uh, to where they could have something to bring against him and accuse him and justify what they do to him. They needed justification. Verse number 8. They didn't say anything. Verse number 8. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Hmm. Well, wrote on the ground. What did he write? Boy, I've, that's got my curiosity for years. For years. What did he write? Now, there's all kinds of opinions on this. But I had to go back and study the Jewish law and the priest and all that to see what, what's going on here. What did he write? You, you guys, it's without seed. You perfect, real. Some people, do you know any Baptists that thinks they're perfect? Do you know any preachers that thinks they're perfect? I think I've met a few of them. They're not. Nobody is perfect. Not a human on this earth is perfect. Never have been and never will be. The only one was Jesus Christ. The only perfect person ever walked and set foot on this earth was Jesus Christ. You, you without sin? None of us are without sin. Couldn't throw the rock. Stooped down again. Rode on the ground. Wow, what did he write? Well... First of all, before I move on, they had it all wrong. See, they didn't think Jesus knew the law. My stars, he was with God when God gave it to Moses, right? Wasn't Jesus with God in the beginning? And when Moses up on Mount Sinai, wasn't Jesus up there with God? And God said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. The order. I want you to commandments, the ordinances, and the order of worship. I, I, and, God, and he was there. 
He knew all about the law. He knew what it said. I mean, from, from, uh, from Exodus, from Leviticus to Deuteronomy, he knew Exodus to, De- Exodus to Deuteronomy, all that. He knew the whole law, okay? These guys had messed up big time. They had messed up big time, these guys had. And they thought they had Jesus tricked. First of all, where's the man at? It takes a man and woman to commit adultery, right? A married man or a married woman uh, having sexual relations, that's adultery. Okay, where's the man at? He's nowhere to be caught seen. Well, I think it is in the book of Exodus. I don't know whether I've got that on the screen or not. But I do have this verse, and this will explain, I'll, I'll explain from, from Jeremiah 17, 13. Look at this one. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. All these Israelites that forsake thee, they're going to be ashamed. And then he says this, And they that depart from me shall be written. Ha <laughs> ha! They that depart from me, they that go away from me shall be written where? In the earth. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Okay, now, see, Jesus knew the law. Now, here's what happened. If this is a Judea, the Judean law, or, uh, law, Mosaic law, if, if a person uh, had committed adultery, then the accusers would go and get the, the man and the woman and bring them to the priest. They had to have at least two witnesses. And I, and I think that's in the Scripture. I think I wrote that, that Scripture down in, in uh, Deuteronomy 22, 22 and Deuteronomy 17 and 6. You'll find that you had to have two or three witnesses. See, you've you, you got to have that. that where the, where's the man and where are the witnesses at? Don't you see the problem with this? There's a problem here, ladies and gentlemen. They brought the woman, didn't bring the man trying to trick Jesus, and Jesus knew the law. And he wrote in the ground the sin of adultery. Yeah. He wrote the woman's name, but he, don't, he didn't have the man's name. But then he began to write the men's name and the sins they had committed in the dirt. Oh, wow. Now it's a different ballgame. You see, God looks on the inside, ladies and gentlemen. He knows our hearts. He knows what you've done today, this week. He knows what I've done this week. He looks on the inside. You can't fool God. So when you take the people that had committed adultery before the priest, the priest would ask for the witnesses. Give me two, three witnesses, and if the witnesses were there, if the witnesses were there, and then and the accusers were there, he wrote the sin, adultery, in the dirt. And it would be in the dirt of the temple. It wasn't to be on permanent. It wasn't to be a permanent writing. It would just be in dirt. And he would write the sin of adultery. Then he would write the man's name, the woman's name, down. And so now the ceremony was, give me three wit- or two witnesses or three. And so the two witnesses would say, I'm, I'm a eyewitness that this man and this woman committed adultery. And then the priest would say, okay, we have the evidence. You guys that make the, the you witnesses, here's your rock. And the witnesses had to be the one that cast the stone at both of them. The witnesses. And they're the ones that had to punish her. And then after they got through, all of the people, the Israelites, did it. He said, that's terrible. Well, it probably was. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you, they didn't do it right. They were trying to trick Jesus like he didn't know the law. He knew the law. He knew every bit of it, but he came to, ch- to fulfill the law. We don't need that anymore. Lord God, we'd all be dead, wouldn't we? We'd all be dead if we had to live with the law. Aren't you glad it's by grace? It's not a work lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. Hallelujah. I'm saved by grace. Woo, saved by grace. And sometimes we get in trouble. You know, sometimes I hear things about so, so, certain, so, certain people, and I say, okay, uh, who's a witness? Well, I only got one witness. That ain't not biblical. Give me, a, give me two witnesses. Ain't that biblical? Two? Didn't Jesus say, if two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be in amongst them? 
Two witnesses. He said at least two or three. And so we got to have some witnesses here. So somebody, have you ever been falsely accused? I have. I've been falsely accused. Okay. And so you've got to find out, is it a credible witness? Is there, what's the motive behind it? And so we, we have been that. Just because you're accused doesn't make you wrong. And yet they want to kill this woman, stone her, no witnesses, no man there, didn't, didn't live with the law. So now when we look at the Scripture, and uh, we've looked at the, the punishment. Now, let me say this before I get to the, to the guilt factor. Uh, the devil would rather start a church fight than to sell a barrel of whiskey. You believe that? I'm telling you, he would. He would rather start a church fight than to sell a barrel of whiskey. Because then it disrupts the saints, it destroys the saints, and then it keeps the sinners from coming to the house of God. Because I've seen churches like that. I've seen them like that. And it's a shame. That's the devil. You've got to be careful about the devil, right? He'll, he'll set you up. He was, he was setting Jesus up. But boy, he met his match, didn't he? Oh, verse 9 and 10. And they which heard it, oh, after they heard it, after Jesus right in the ground, where's the witnesses, uh, where's the man, all that, and wrote the, uh, where, their names. Uh, now we got the guilt factor. You know, let me tell you something about guilt. You, you know, <sighs> guilt factor. What does pain, when you have pain in your body, let me illustrate, like, when you have pain in your body, what does it tell you? Something's wrong? When you have pain and I have pain, it tells me there's something wrong in my body. And I'll try to do over-the-counter stuff and it doesn't work. Then I've got, what i got to do that? Go to the doctor, right? I end up going to the doctor. So i I got a pain. i got to deal with it. I remember one time I had a pain in my foot. Now, this is, this is hilarious, but it's the truth. I had a pain in my foot. I went to church. I couldn't hardly walk. I hobbled around, and I preached all over. And I, my foot was killing me. I'm preaching, and my foot's killing me. I went ahead and preached. I got home, hobbled home, got home. I said, Barbara, pull this sock off and see what's wrong. I'm going to have to go to the doctor. She pulled it off, and there's a peppermint candy about that big in my sock. <laughs> I, hey, Barbara, I thought I would die. And I said, there's something wrong. i got to find out what's wrong with me. And there was that. Peppermint candy, when I put my sock on, I don't know how it got in there. But boy, I thought I was going to have to have my foot operate on it. But I dealt with the problem, right? I took the peppermint candy out and it got all right. When you got pain and you got guilt, ladies and gentlemen, we have to deal with it, right? I got to deal with that guilt. How do I deal with it? Take it to Jesus. And if you've got pain in your heart, if you've got pain in your life, if you've got guilt in your life, deal with it. Deal with it. I've been there. Ain't a one of us hadn't been there. We know what guilt is. We know exactly what guilt is. The guilt factor. All right, but now let's move on to the next thing, okay? And when Jesus lifted up himself, he saw none, but then he said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers at? <laughs> I have, not, no man could condemn thee no because Jesus said this their conscience had got a hold of them and they realized wait a minute man he told me things I didn't know they something different about this man he knew my whole life he knew my whole life where your accusers at <laughs> I have none I have none Lord nobody can accuse me they're guilty listen I can't accuse one of you you can't accuse me and I can't accuse you I can't look into your heart and you can't look into my heart only God has the ability to do that right Amen. I can't accuse nobody I ain't going to try to accuse nobody <laughs> who are your accusers at what'd she say here's what she said now let's look at the grace factor the guilt factor, they, they were so guilty, their conscience just tore them up. And, and then here she stands, and she was guilty, and she knew it. She knew she was guilty. She was caught. 
and said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. You, you go. I'm not going to condemn you. Well, she was guilty. She was guilty of sin, right? She was caught in the very act of adultery. She was, she was caught. But I don't condemn you. You know, uh, years ago, we, the old timers used to tell me that you live in adultery. You don't live in adultery. That's it, not taught in the Bible. I thought they knew what they're talking about. You live in adultery. You don't live in adultery. People can commit adultery, but it's no more than telling a white lie or, or doing this or stealing something. God forgives all sin. Nobody said, well, that so-and-so committed this sin, that so-and-so committed that sin. I've never done that, therefore I'm better than it. You ain't a bit better than nobody. Brother, bless God, if you break one, you broke them all, right? When you break one commandment, you broke them all. There ain't nobody sin. Let me tell you, don't ever look at somebody and say, well, they're worse than I am. No, no, no. We're, uh, the only sin that takes you to hell is the sin of unbelief in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter. That this, Jesus, I don't condemn you. It's not right what you're doing. This is wrong what you're doing. But telling a lie is wrong. Uh, stealing's wrong. Cheating's wrong. Everything's wrong. I mean, there's a lot of wrong. Sure, it's wrong. It's, and and the, uh, the consequences of it's de devastating, maybe, in different categories of sin. But still, sin is sin. And said, so neither do I condemn that. I want you to go. But then he said this. Stop doing, stop committing adultery. Stop lying, stop drinking, stop cheating, stop smoking pot, stop drinking your drugs. Stop that stuff. Do it. That's repentance, right? Stop it. When you get saved, you want to stop it, right? You, you want to. Hmm. All right, closing. But let me say this. I, before, I, before I go, I, it, it came to me. I, I heard Dr. Uh, Adrian Rogers say this. He said, there was a lady called him from Rome, Georgia, was in the hospital in Memphis, and she had a blood issue, and she was bleeding to death, and she was going to die. Two of the young men from the church, Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, went over to the hospital. She's needing blood. And these two young men didn't know her, didn't know who she was, but she but it was somehow got around to them that she needed blood. And they go over and they give her blood. And so they told her that there were two young men from Bellevue Baptist Church that had come and given her some blood. She didn't know who they were, didn't know their names, but she, they told her where Bellevue Baptist Church was, who the pastor was, so she gets on the phone and she calls Dr. Brother Rogers, and says, Brother Rogers, I, I, I don't know who these young guys were, but I was needing blood. I was had a blood I needed a blood transfusion, and they came and gave me blood. And I want you to thank whoever they were. And said, I want to tell you the note they left me. And they wrote a note. And said, Jesus gave his blood for us, and we're going to give our blood for you. Wow. And she, they saved her life. Uh, that's what I said. Jesus gave his blood for us, Amen. right? Then we ought to give our life for others, right? Amen. Yeah. Not that we can save them. Not that, a death, that our death would save them. That's not what I'm talking about. No, no, no. I'm talking about loving people and, and helping people and not judging people. Because if you, if, you, if you look and judge somebody, you better get the two before out of your eye. You know? And I, any of us, we all have that problem, you know. From me to you, we got to be careful about that. Never to judge a person. Leave that to God. Leave it to God. Conscience. I, I've got, I, I want to show you this. A good conscience is 1 Peter 3.16. I, I love it. I want a good conscience, right? I've had a good conscience. I have. 
And I got a good conscience right now. As I speak to you right now, my conscience is good. I don't know anything that I need to get right between me and God. I, I was very early this morning, man. God had talked. I said, okay, God, if there's anything in there, I want in my heart, you, you let me know. And I, I, repentance, the confession is to agree with God. I agree with you over whatever it is. I agree with you. It's wrong. Okay. That's a good conscience. Okay. Now, a pure conscience. I, I, I like a pure conscience too. And that's in 1 Timothy 3 9. Conscience is pure and holy. Only the Holy Spirit can make it that way. But you'll find that in that scripture, a pure conscience. But then there's a third one. And that is a purged conscience. Hebrews 9 14. My punch, conscience has been purged, cleansed. It's been purged and it's been cleansed. And it has to be that quite often, right? Probably every day, every day, I, I want you, God, to purge and cleanse my palm. Okay? What about a seer's conscience? A seer's. That's a callous conscience. Boy, now it gets different, right? It really gets different now because seers means calloused and hard and impenetrable. Nothing can penetrate it. Uh, you know, you can do horrible things and it don't bother you and there's no guilt. That's a seer's conscience. Do you know people's got those? There's all kinds of people outside these walls that got serious conscience. Nothing can penetrate their conscience. And you, in law, you, you folks who are in law enforcement officer in, in, in that, you know that. You've seen people. You, you know well, these, are, these people are a different breed of people. They have no conscience whatsoever. There's a lot of them. And we're seeing that today, right? We're seeing all kinds of atrocities and murders and things happen. And they have a serious conscience. But I'm willing to look at another one, and this is the one uh, that really, an evil conscience. I mean, just a pure evil conscience turned over to a reprobate mind. God give up on them. God just said, there's no hope for you, and give up on them. I picked three people. I'm going to put them on the screen. I picked three people that I know that probably, and one of them was professed to be a preacher. I want to show you a person with a bad, seared, evil conscience. Some of you remember this. Some of you young people, you don't know who this is, probably, unless you've been taught it. I don't know that you have. This man here, Jim Jones. I, I know many of you remember Jim Jones, right? Okay, I got, there's a caption right before. Jim Jones, the founder and leader of jo Jonestown, Guyana, a community of over 900 members of the People's Temple, Full Gospel Church, an offshoot of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and that was in California. He moved to uh, South Africa and took 900 people with him. And one of the Congress or Senator men went over there uh, to see what was going on. You remember the story? They killed them. And then this man, professing to be a, a, a man of God, had such an evil conscience that he put poison in the Kool-Aid and poisoned 900 people. And they drank it. And they all died. That's an that evil conscience, right? Where do you think that he went? He went to hell. You, know, you don't go to heaven doing things like that. He went to hell because he had an evil conscience. Well, it was this. I wanted to find a woman. I said, okay, I got, I got a man here. I got two men and a woman. This is the world's worst serial killer. The world's worst. I didn't know she was from Memphis, Tennessee. The world's worst serial killer. And it was really in 19, uh, 1891 to 1950, what, that'd be 59 years old. She was 59 years old, and she was a serial killer. She was a pedophile. And she was a kidnapper and human trafficker. Now, that is a mean woman, ain't it? Amen. But that mean woman had what? An evil conscience. A seer's conscience. To do such a thing as that. I could put something relevant today. Oh, for the news today, it happens, right? Probably tomorrow something will happen in America. If not in America, it'll happen somewhere in the world because the world is full of evil conscience. Let me tell you something, boy, that, while I got it on my mind, I, I'm, I'm just listening to God. Listen to God. Do you believe in degrees of evil? Amen. Absolutely. I think, I, I'm not sure whether I brought it with me or not. Probably didn't. But uh, I know it's in Jude. When you read Jude that there are certain angels 
Now get this. Hang in here with me. There are certain angels that, are, that left their habitat, and that's heaven. And they're in chains right now as I speak. They're in darkness and, and, and probably in hell. And they are in chains that can't even get loose. They're supernatural demons. They are so evil that God won't even let them loose on this earth. You can read Jude, Jude, Jude 1, 6. Right before Revelation, that chapter. That's Jesus' step, uh, step brother. They're so wicked and so bad that God put them in chains that I'm not going to turn them loose on the culture. Lord, God, I'd hate to face them guys, wouldn't you? Amen. I'm telling you, I'm like E.V. Hill, the black preacher, wonderful preacher, God, one of the godliest preachers i ever heard preach. I love E.V. Hill. He's in glory now. But he was in oh, and, and Los Angeles and preached. And, and you know, he, he, he talked about demons. He said, <laughs> they follow me around everywhere I go. I said, hey, man, EV, I thought I was the only one that happened to you. Oh, no. I mean, you, you follow EV around. I mean, what a wonderful man of God EV Hill was. Lord, I love to hear him preach. I still get to hear him preach on tape. But he'll follow you around. This demons, we're, they're, they're everywhere. There are myriads of them to, that, that rebel with God, against God. So they're present everywhere to attack us, our minds. I told you last Sunday, this is where the battle is in our minds. And so, boy, I'm sure glad that crowd's locked up in chains. How in the world could I put up with something worse than what I already put up with? Way, way wickeder. If there is degrees of evil, is there degrees of punishment? Well, of course there is. And, 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 and uh, you'll find that, that Jesus said, woe is Capernaum, woe is uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. It'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than you, Capernaum. Uh, you, in the judgment, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah will fire better than you because you've got me and they didn't have me. And I'm bar paraphrasing now. And so, you know, they didn't hear me. You're hearing me. And you will be whipped with many stripes. You will be whipped with many stripes. So there are, there are degrees of wickedness, but there's degrees of punishment in hell. I mean, you look at Joseph Stalin and Khrushchev and, and, and all these evil, uh, Obama and, and all these other ones that's, that's killed people. Obama, I think I get his picture here. This is, this is the one I want to show you. And, and we know this one. We all know this one. This guy, Osama bin Laden. He was 54 years old. And you know how many, he killed over what? How many, over 3,000 people. Our people here in America. This is a mean, mean, evil, conscience person. And he's dead. Where's he at? Well, he's in hell. How Will he be punished with many stripes? Amen. And you take Joseph Dahmer and all, all that, and Charles Mason that just died, and all these people that have such evil conscience, they are going to pay dearly for what they do, have done. Amen. There's degrees of evil. There's degrees of punishment. And just the least amount of punishment is worse than anything that you can even imagine. If you're here today and you're not saved, oh, I hate to say this. I hate to say it, but I have to say it. If you're here today and you're not born again, you're not saved by God's grace, and if you were to die today, you'd go have to live with this guy here. Right? Preach, you ought not to say that. Well, what would you say? If you were preaching, what would you say? You might go. You will go. If you're not saved. And I say that in love. And so let me say to you, you don't want to go there with these kinds of people. You want to go to heaven, amen. I, gotta, I ain't going to quit on a negative note. I'm going to quit on a positive note. You want to go to heaven and be with angels and uh, our loved ones and uh, most of all is Jesus because that's the grace factor, right? Amen. 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 Wow, aren't you glad you're saved today? 
Aren't you glad? Who, who, I don't know who you is at, but I'll tell you this morning I was in my uh, study and, and just about 25 yards up there. I, I used to be in the ball field where I played ball. And I said, that's where God, you convicted me. That's where you convicted me of my sin. And about 100 yards, there's an old house over there that I was saved in, about 100 yards apart. And I thought about that. I was convicted here and converted over there. I'll never forget that moment that God's Holy Spirit came into my heart and showed me my lostness. And I'll never forget when I said, Jesus, come into my heart. Glory to God, he flooded my soul, and he's still alive in there. Amen? And I want you to know it. I want you to know that he's alive in my heart and doing quite well. And I thank him every day for what he has done for me. It's, it's the grace factor. It's the grace factor. Are you saved today? Amen. Are you glad you're saved? Amen. If you had to do over, would you do it again? <laughs> Amen, I'd do it all over again. I can't get saved at one time. We're just there just one time. I, and boy, it was good that time. And I want to tell you today, right now, this is a time you need to make. The, you can make the great decision you've made in your life right here this morning. You can make the greatest decision you've made in your life. That's Jesus coming to your heart. I ain't going to come and drag you up here. I ain't going to make you feel so guilty. I'm just telling you, if you're not saved, you're lost. You need to be saved today. Today is the day of salvation. What if Jesus were to come tomorrow? And I think we're close to it, don't you? I mean, what if he were to come tomorrow? It'd be too late for you. Come on and let Jesus come into your heart. I beg you, I plead with you, come. come in, let him come into your heart. While your conscience is tender and pliable, he'll come in and, wow. Best friend you ever had, right? What a friend we have in Jesus. Hallelujah. What a friend we have in Jesus. I don't know whether it's done you any good or not, but it sure did me. It sure did me. I got blessed by getting it, and I got blessed by preaching it. God is so good. Stand with me for prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask you to anoint me, and you did. I ask you to give me wisdom, and you did. And you, I ask you to give me understanding, and you did. And I pray this morning. I've delivered my soul. I've told the truth. And God, if there's anyone here that you're knocking at their heart's door, and they're ready to give their heart to you, let them walk out. Come down here and say, Preacher, I want to give my heart to Christ. I want to be saved this morning. I want to go to heaven. I want the grace factor. I've got the guilt factor, but I want the grace factor. Father, you'll take the grace factor away. I mean the guilt factor away and replace it with grace, just like that woman. I believe that woman got saved. She went on her way and stopped her sinning and got right with you. Your mercy is unequaled. No matter what we've done, or no matter what we've not done, God, We're lost without hope until we ask you to come into our hearts and save us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Earl. Come on, right now. God speaks to your heart. You come right now. 157. <laughs> What a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shame. Trust? Do you trust the Word? You, you trust the Word. Okay. That's good. 
Intellectually, you trust the Word. Do you trust the Word enough to say, I'm not a Christian, I'm not saved, but I want to be saved, but I'm just kind of scared? Trust the Word. For God sent His Son to seek and to save those which was lost. He's going through the pews and He's searching everybody's heart. He knows whether you're saved or lost. He knows you. We ain't fooling Him. He knows everything. Now, if, if, if you can step out and say, I trust the Word. The preacher said that if I would come and as she's coming in my heart, I can be saved. They obey now. you got to obey. Trust, obey. Come and let Jesus come into your heart. Now, I'm, I, I can't understand why people turn this kind of preaching down anymore. I don't know, but this generation is good at it. I want to tell you, this generation is good at rejecting God's truth today. Don't resist and reject God's infallible, inerrant word. If God is speaking to you, come right now and let the Holy Spirit do a wonderful thing in your heart. I'll stay with you all day to let Jesus come into your heart. Sing another verse right now. Come on, right now, if God speaks to you. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a tear, not a sigh nor a tear, and about why we trust and obey. Trust and obey. Oh, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Right. You made a choice. You made a choice. I think you made the wrong choice. I really do. I believe my heart somebody made the wrong choice. You made the wrong choice. But God still loves you. And I hope you have many more opportunities. Can you guarantee that you'll have many more opportunities to get saved? You can. You can. My heart, my conscience is clear. I preach the word. Clear conscience. Clear. Now tonight, this happened. I've got a friend that I really developed a relationship to give to, to the staff at uh, Dodson when Gabe <laughs> left and went to Providence. Young man by the name of uh, Mac Dixon from the First Baptist Church Alcoa. He became the uh, youth pastor at Dodson. And I never met Matt. He was over there and his pastor left and went I think to Kansas. And uh, so uh, I developed a relationship with Matt through Bible study and teaching the Word of God, and we had a wonderful time. We, Matt's a wonderful young man, boy, and not many people down at Dodson told me he's doing a great job. They just love him down there. And I said, that's a wonderful, fine, fine young man. And So uh, I didn't know that I'd made an impression on him until uh, a while back. Well, Preacher Jim called me and said, uh, we're going to ordain uh, Matt and said, uh, I asked him about, you know, his pastor. Of course, his pastor's gone. And I said, uh, Matt, do you have anybody else you would like to come and be on this uh, ordination council? He said, yeah, I'd like to have Preacher Merle. Well, he called me. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, Lord. I, 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 but tonight, I'm not preaching. And we're going to have singing. You guys love singing. That's fine. And he said, I love singing. But it's tonight. So, so ordination's tonight. And, and he wants me to be there, and I feel like that I, could, I need to be there to help ordain this young man that I'm so proud of, that loves God and preaches the Word and believes the Word. And I get to be a part of that tonight. So I won't be here tonight. So you and, hey, Earl, you and uh, Kenny, take care of that for me. We, the, them tell the quartet or trio that I'm sorry, but I've got to go honor this young man and help him and get him ordained. If I was preaching, I wouldn't go. I just said I couldn't do it. But he asked me, and I said, well, since they're singing, I can go there and do that. So 